So welcome to the Boone County History and Culture Center's Meet the Author program. We aim to provide conversations with authors from Missouri and those who know a lot about Missouri. I'm David Weber. Well, thank you to our sponsors, including Simmons Bank and to the staff of the History Center for making this interview possible. As soon as the pandemic is over, we will be meeting in person at the History Center on the third Saturday of each month at 10.30 a.m. But until then, I hope to use this Zoom technology to record interviews with authors who, might, who we might not otherwise hear from. With today's interview is with Peter Hessler, author of five books, the first three about China in his fifth and most recent book about Egypt and a book of short stories squeezed in between. He's currently a writer for the New Yorker living in China and has written several articles about the coronavirus. Pete is from Columbia. He's a 1988 graduate of Hickman High School before going to Princeton. He's a Rhodes Scholar and a winner of a MacArthur Fellowship, often called a Genius Grant, which he must be because he's fluent in Chinese and, and Arabic. I'm excited to have been in contact with him because he's a product of Columbia Public and Catholic Schools and the Stewart Road neighborhood. I'm fascinated that he and his sisters knew Walter and Willoughby Johnson. Some of you recall that I interviewed Walter Johnson, now a Harvard University history professor, a few months ago. And I will interview Willoughby next month. Perhaps Peter and I will have time to talk about his boyhood in Columbia after we talk about his books. So uh, welcome, Peter. Uh, thank you for making time to talk with us. Yeah, thanks so much. Peter. I'm happy to be here. I, I, I wish I could be there in person. It's been a while since I've been back to Columbia. Well, uh, maybe I'll ask you about that at the end. So uh, you went back to China, what, in 2019? Yeah, we came back in August of 2019. Um, and the original plan was for me to teach one year and then we were going to transition to to a journalist visa and be here for a probably a total of five years. But of course, things really changed because the the pandemic began in the January after we moved here. So, so uh, what are you doing now? Well, I you know the things that changed were first of all that China became closed, right? I mean, so since March of 2020, China was closed to foreigners. There've been a few times when they've let a few people in, but not many. So basically, once that policy was in place, we knew that if we left, um, we couldn't get back in. I'm, I'm here with my wife and my two daughters. My daughters are in a Chinese public school. So at that point, you know, and of course, that also meant that the New Yorker could not send correspondents here. They can't send any writers here to do stories. Um, so we made the decision that it was better to stay and for me to continue reporting. I extended my teaching job for another year. And so I've really been teaching full-time and writing full-time. It's been an incredibly busy period. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know that um, you originally went to China with the Peace Corps in 1996. And then uh, what you stayed there for what until 2007. So almost 10 years, or more than 10 years. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. So I was, so I first, I first went to China actually as a tourist. So that was in 1994. Oh. You know, oh. I, when I, I went home from, I went to graduate school at, at Oxford University, and then I traveled home to Columbia, Missouri, to where my parents were living, and still live. I, I, I made that trip to the east. You know, going from Oxford first to Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and then across Russia and into Asia. And before that trip, I had not had any interest in China or really in Asia. Um, and this was just, to me, an adventure and, and a different way of going home. I ended up traveling for six months. I arrived in Beijing in 1994. It must have been August, I think. Um, and something about the place kind of grabbed me. I, I, you could sense an energy. Uh, I wasn't really aware mm -hmm. that China was changing the way that it was. And, and so it started the idea that maybe I should try to come back and, and, and live here and try to learn the language. So when I did return to Colombia, which was early in 1995, at the end of that long trip, I applied to the Peace Corps um, mm -hmm. and I ended up coming over to China in 1996. Two years in the Peace Corps, I returned to Columbia briefly, wrote the first draft of my book, River Town, in about just a few months actually. And so then I went almost immediately back to Beijing. Uh, 
to become a freelance writer. And I ended up staying until 2007. So it was 11 years on that first run. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then you went to um, Egypt in 2011, I think it was? Yeah. And how did you make that decision? I mean, that's quite a, quite a change, isn't it? Well, although I, I guess there are some similarities in the two ancient cultures. Yeah, but, yeah um, you know, I mean, part of that decision was because by the end of my time in, in China, I had met my wife, Leslie Chang, who's also a writer. She was with the Wall Street she was with the Wall Street Journal, and then she became freelance and, and, and wrote a book, Factory Girls. I read, yeah. So as we left China, we were making plans for the future, and we decided we wanted to live in the United States for a spell, but then we wanted to go overseas again. But both of us wanted to do something different from China. I, you know, I felt like there was partly a risk of only being seen as a China writer. Um, you can also be, be become a little bit vulnerable because of the political uncertainties here, and so if you get if you build your entire career only on China and then the communist party decides they don't want you here anymore, then, mm -hmm. you know, then sometimes that's a very traumatic experience for scholars and, and writers. Um, so I, you know, I, I wanted to establish, and I also wanted to establish to the magazine that I could write about other places and establish it mm -hmm. for myself that I didn't need to live in China. Um, and we also felt like it would be really useful to have another sort of developing world perspective. I mean, people tend to be area specialists, and we felt like adding another part of the world would help us understand China better. And also would, we would bring the China background to this other place. So we thought a lot about possibilities. We thought about, say, India. Um, but there were a lot of direct China-Indian comparisons at that time. Um, and there was also, you know, there isn't, most people who go there don't end up learning a language. You kind of end up speaking English um, because so many of the elite can speak English. And we wanted to go to a place with a, with a rich language. Um, I like having a place with a deep history. I'm interested in archaeology. And so the Middle East was interesting to us. And so we originally thought about either Syria or Egypt. Um, by the time we ended up making the move in 2011, Syria was no longer possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Egypt was where we went. So um, did you live mostly in Cairo? I mean, I get the impression from uh, um, your book that you moved around quite a bit. Or that you did, that you traveled a bit, quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, Egypt is not that difficult to travel in. It's, it's not it's not like China or the United States. It's not a huge country. Um, we were based in Cairo. We considered being based in other places. But, you know, the revolution had started by the time we moved there. The Arab Spring had begun. And I realized that in order, part of what I needed to do was to be able to cover these very intense political events. And you really had to be in Cairo to do that. Um, so, so we, we set up a base in Cairo. We, our, our home was in a place called Zemelik, which is an island in the Nile. And it's, it's sort of a great place because it's, you know, it feels a little bit isolated from the city, but it's right there. You're right in the middle. You know, I mean, I could get to, I could walk to Tahrir Square if I wanted to, you know, so it was really, we really liked living there. Um, and, but we did, you know, I was very mobile and be, partly because of my China experience, I've always been aware that you don't want to focus too much on the capital. Um, you know, Beijing, even when I lived in Beijing in China, I did almost all of my reporting and all of my stories outside of Beijing because I felt like it was not that representative of China. And so one thing that I did fairly early in Egypt was establish a place in the South where I could focus on. And I ended up choosing a place called Abydos, um, which is sort of the origins of the, the, the first hieroglyphics, for example, were found there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the earliest sort of Egyptian state, the, the, the first dynasty, their ancestors came from that area. That's what, the, what they're believed to have come from. So I would make trips to that area, partly to meet the archaeologists and talk about archaeology, but also yeah, just yeah. to talk about current mm -hmm. events and get to know the mm -hmm. villagers and the government and to give me some balance, you know, against the capital city. Yeah. And, um uh, I remember what, your third book on China is Country Driving. So I guess I think of you as traveling quite a bit and sleeping in a tent along the road and stuff. Did you travel the same way in Egypt? I mean, pretty much. Bought a car. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, you know, I grew up in Columbia, Missouri, so I drove <laughs> early, right? I mean, I bought, I bought my first car when I was 16, you know, oh, 1974 Dodge Dart. Oh, seven hundred, yeah. seven hundred and seventy dollars that I for my paper out money. 
Um, you know, so you're a Midwesterner, you drive a lot. I'm comfortable <laughs> with that. And I, in China, I enjoyed it because it gave me freedom. To be honest, in China, it was also a benefit to be able to drive myself because, you know, anytime that you're adding a, a translator or a driver or any sort of other person, it changes who you are, especially as a foreigner, and you become much more of a retinue. You know, you, you, you sort of have this this group of people who are going places. It's more intimidating sometimes. They think the foreigner's an important person, whatever. Um, so I, it also can be a security risk if you have a driver in China. Drive, you know, the the public security bureau in China mm. will often coordinate with drivers so that they can give them information about where the uh, foreigner is yeah. going. So it's all yeah. it's often better, in my opinion, in in countries in authoritarian countries, it's not bad to be able to drive yourself um, because mm. drivers are, are are security risks basically. Um, so I got a license in Egypt and we bought a car. I mean, Egypt was, it is a very difficult place to drive much harder than in, 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 in China. And, and I found it very difficult, especially in Cairo. How, how so? Uh, because of other traffic or to information maps and things? Everything, you know, the infrastructure is, is, is very problematic, you know? And I mean, when I started driving in China and I described that in my book, country driving, the roads were pretty rough and there were a lot of incomplete, you know, the infrastructure was developing rapidly and there were a lot of holes in the system. It's no longer like that. I mean, driving in China now is really quite easy. Um, exactly. But yeah, but Egypt at the time, I mean, it's, it, you know, this is a very problematic economic, you know, place. And and, and so there, there's a lot of infrastructure problems. The, the roads can be chaotic, um, but really it's also just incredibly aggressive. <laughs> drivers. Um, different from China in that when I was in China, everybody was a new driver back in the early 2000s. And so mm -hmm. nobody really knew what they're doing. The Egyptians are actually highly skilled. I, I, I found them to be quite, you know, the people driving really, they knew how to use a car, but they were very aggressive, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. and to be honest, I mean, maybe one of my, one of my theories is probably not a very complicated theory is you just look at the cars on the road and like 98% of them, it seems, are driven by men. There's very few women driving. And and you just have this incredible hyped up masculinity on the road. Mm -hmm. And it can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, the highway, one thing that people love doing on the highway. So if you're going on the highway and you're on the right lane and somebody's going to pass you going 120 miles an hour, the thing they love to do in Egypt is to get that car to go as fat, as close to you as possible. You mm -hmm. know? So, you know, they just, I don't know what was going on, right? But this is a thrill somehow. You know, it's like everybody, there are some moments when you wonder, is everybody driving in this country a 16-year-old male? Um, yeah. That's kind of what they're behaving like. And so I would, I learned to look in my rearview mirror. And when I saw somebody coming, I would wait till they're pretty close. And then I'd go over to the right so he wouldn't be able to get that that thrill, yeah. uh, you know, of, of, of buzzing me. But I mean, so it's just yeah. a lot of stuff like that. It's, you know, yeah. makes it challenging. How about things like... Uh Traffic regulations and police enforcement is there a big, a big difference between the two. Um, I, I mean, China is enforced very rigorously, and now it's all enforced enforced remotely. So you know, you have traffic cameras that will give you tickets. I mean, you really have to okay. you you have to obey the rules, or else you're going to lose your license. Basically, is that, uh, um, mm -hmm. Egypt was there were yeah there were police on the roads, and but as a foreigner, I was always able to talk myself out of talk my way out of any of any issue. So that wasn't such a problem. Yeah. So um, when Americans, I think, think about China and Egypt, I think the two metaphors or the two images that come to mind are probably the Great Wall and the pyramids. Mm -hmm. is, that, um, is that very helpful in understanding differences between the, soci the societies? I mean, it's it's probably not a bad place to start. I mean, part of China's special status in the world is that it has always been somewhat isolated. The Great Wall is to some degree a symbol of that isolation, although, although the wall is sort of used in sometimes in inaccurate ways as a symbol. But it is it does represent something that China was generally a place that closed itself off. It's one reason why that's what it's what we're doing right now during the pandemic. I mean, so these patterns hold true. Mm -hmm. Um, in Egypt, the pyramids, I mean, what do they say about Egypt? I mean, partly they talk what they, what the pyramids represent is this ability to, to marshal labor, which, which happened very early in Egyptian history. It also says something about the landscape because, you know, why were they able to build these things is partly because of the, the cycles of flooding on the Nile 
mm. meant that you have you have these long periods where the river floods. You know, it, it's an amazing place because unlike mm. China, unlike in ancient China, when you look at like where I live here in Chengdu, the key to development in ancient times was a brilliant irrigation system that was set up. You know, you know, more than two thousand years ago, and that sort of made this the the, the Sichuan Plain incredibly fertile and allowed for is that right i didn't know yeah that so so the mm -hmm. early infrastructure works same thing is true in samaria and places like this so usually that's what happens with great rivers and great civilizations egypt is different um their first irrigation i mean they really did very little to irrigate and even the earliest water wheel like the most basic not even a water wheel something they call a shaduf which is like you just a lever to lift water up by hand you know so not even a proper water wheel just a lever that thing doesn't appear on the historical record until like the new kingdom, you know, so, you know, a thousand, mm. more than a thousand years after the pyramids mm. have been built. So they didn't need to irrigate because the flood cycles of the Nile were so naturally ah. appropriate for agriculture. You just wait for the river yep. to flood. Yep. When it floods, you retreat to the village, which is up on a hill and mm. you just wait. And then you wait for the waters to recede. And when the waters recede, you plant. So what do you do while you're waiting? You take all the peasants and you take them up to Cairo and build the pyramids. You know, so it, it was a it was very easy because you have this agricultural season where people aren't working as much. You could take them up and do massive labor projects. So you know, I think the 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 pyramids. That's when I look at the pyramids. I often think about that. I was thinking more of you know regal burial places. So you had to enslave people to build that and to put all that, all the, all the resources it would take. To yeah, I mean, both things, it's like any ancient civilization that, you know, part of, part of your, the way you establish control is to make people do things. And there are certain patterns that seem maternal. I mean, both, both ancient mm. China and ancient Egypt had early periods where they had huge numbers of human sacrifices to accompany the, you know, the, the, yeah. the king <laughs> into the afterlife. And then yeah. they're very quickly, very quickly, they, they shift to finding some kind of substitute for those people. So obviously there's some pushback going on, right? And, mm. and people realize mm. it's not sustainable to like kill your top officials and also a bunch of young people every time the, the king dies. And so they figure out some other way to do it. So you see these same stages in both places and both of them started their writing systems in the same way. They start with, you know, sort of a pictorial representations of things and then it shifts to what is called yeah, I, what, what's what's called a, a logographic language um which is hieroglyphs yeah. and and chinese characters are both examples of that type of writing the difference of course is that the egyptians stopped writing hieroglyphs and the chinese continued and they still do so um did you find yourself comparing your egyptian experience with china i mean constantly um, yeah no constantly i mean that was and I, I think actually sometimes I think that regional specialists don't like this. Um, and there's always been some pushback from elite Egyptians. And, and you know, I think people sometimes say, well, you know, you can't talk about China. This is Egypt. It's special. There is always this, and both China and Egypt, like the United States, see themselves as very special, unique cultures. They're incredibly patriotic and very strong sense of themselves. It's, you know, something else that, that, that interests me about Egypt. But so you do sometimes get resistance to this, but to me, I, you know, I found it incredibly helpful and, and it really, I felt, my wife felt this as well, Leslie has the same feeling that it really helped us get a different perspective. And I think we have a very unusual take on both places. And so you are constantly thinking about this and, and this can happen on all kinds of levels. I mean, for example, the moment that we were there, um, you know, I was in China from 96 to 2007. Um, this was a period of immense change incredible economic change and incredible social change you know so you would see for example the status of women changing a lot because young women are going to the to the southern factories and working they're becoming financially successful they're gaining power in their families in their villages when they go back um and then i also lived in egypt of course during five years of the arab spring during a period of great political change um but the, the interesting thing was in china there was no political change at all you know, the Communist Party was in power when I showed up and it was in power uh, when I left, yeah. basically stronger than it was and it never had been. And, but in Egypt, there was all this political change during those years. You know, we had, I don't know how many prime ministers, but we had the Muslim Brotherhood rise to power and then there was a coup and they were overthrown. And so you had lots of political change, but really no social or economic change. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it, it kind of makes made me think about, you know, what 
do we think of as a revolutionary society or revolutionary moment because Egypt was often referred to as a revolution, but people's actual lives weren't changing very much. And the ways that they interacted, the, the status of women, the status of young people, those remain quite static. Um, whereas in China, which was politically very static, um, had incredible economic and social change. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, what are some reasons that um, Egypt has not changed? Uh, are they more sta uh, are they more close to Middle Eastern neighbors, for example? Yeah, there's there, there's a lot of ways to think about this. Um, I guess I could talk about a couple. I mean, one another big difference between Egypt and China is that you know Egypt was colonized pretty early by Al you know Egypt was was isolated in its early history, um, which allowed it to develop the way it did. But it's quite close to Europe. It's close to other places in the Middle East. It was and it was a natural target for powerful societies in the yeah, region yeah, and, yeah. and so you know the greeks came the persians came the romans came. everybody would try to get a piece of egypt um and that meant that from 180 you know 186 bc is the last time an egyptian declared himself pharaoh this was somebody in the south and he actually wasn't even in charge of the country but anyway he he had enough power in that region to call himself pharaoh and then he was overthrown um but from that moment from 186 bc until 1952, you didn't, you don't have a single Egyptian ruler of Egypt. Is that right? Huh? It's all outsiders, you know. So you're looking at something like Cleopatra is not Egyptian, you know, King Farouk huh? is not Egyptian. I mean, all these people huh? are outsiders, you know, and, mm. and, and you've got, um, you know, because under King Farouk, you know, they, the British are really in, in charge and you had the French at different periods. And so I think, you know, that does incredible it changes the way a country operates, right? Obviously. And it's like, if you looked at China, 186 BC is the Western Han dynasty. You know, if you imagine what would China be like if from the Western Han to Mao Zedong, they had not had a single Chinese person running yeah. the country. Um, it, you know, it's a huge, it, 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 it's a huge psychological difference. Yeah. So, you know, this is a place that traditionally has had a lot of colonial structures, which tend to weaken local initiative and, and it tends to reduce change. Mm -hmm. um, they've also become very dependent on outside assistance. So, you know, they, they depend a lot on, you know, aid from the United States, aid from Europe, aid from the Middle East, from the Gulf countries. Um, and I think that also mm -hmm. changes your, you mm -hmm. know, your ability to transform yourself. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's also an issue just of, you mentioned geography. Um, you know, your neighbors matter and, and, and who you, your, your context, right? And so when China came out of the Mao years in the 1970s, Mao Zedong dies in 1976, Deng Xiaoping comes to power after, you know, a lot of struggles and he begins the reforms in 1978. At that point, when China, when the Chinese leaders look around them, what they see is Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. What did we do wrong? That's that's their feeling. Uh, you know, we have fallen behind all of these countries that we used to or these neighbors that we used to be more advanced than they're way ahead of us. So there was this feeling that and, and so part of that was a recognition that we messed up. We, you know, we took a wrong path. We have to change this. The other thing that was good about that is they could look for strategies so they could say, well, what worked for these places? And then they look at South Korea, they look at Taiwan, um, a lot of, you know, they did a lot of export processing zones. You set up special economic zones. You can try new policies there. You have foreigners come in and invest. And that's what the Chinese did in Shenzhen and other places. So they adopted a lot. They could adopt, you know, strategies from their neighbors um, and look at Egypt. You know, in, in, you know, when we were in Egypt during the Arab Spring, um, people would often say to me, well, at least we're doing better than Syria, you know. Um, mm -hmm. you know that's their context, right? I mean, yeah, you've got yeah. the bar is low, you know, or we're not yeah, Iraq, yeah. you know, which yeah, is true. Yeah. Like the one, one of the great saving grace of Egypt is that it's not a colonial, even though it has this colonial history, it's not a colonial creation the way Syria is. They didn't take different mm -hmm. cultures uh, and throw yeah. them together. Egypt is a mm -hmm. coherent place. They People believe they're Egyptian. That helps hold it together. But... Mm -hmm. There needs to be, in my opinion, a significant mm. reimagining mm. of the role of women, the role of young people, and how mm. an economy operates. You know, they, they they would really benefit 
from using some of these more aggressive strategies that, for example, the Chinese and other Asian countries mm -hmm. use, but they don't have the models, you know? So, you mm -hmm. know, the model is basically just mm -hmm. foreign aid. And I, you know, I, I think it really saps their, mm -hmm. their uh, creativity and it saps mm -hmm. their, uh, reduces their energy for, for change. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the neighbors matter, you know, I think it makes a big mm -hmm. difference. So, um, in my mind, Egypt would be more difficult as a journalist. Did you find that, I mean, in terms of censorship or restrictions on your mobility? Was it much um, different? Not really. You know, that wasn't the, I mean, it was more difficult because it was a politically complicated period and there was a fair amount of violence. And so sometimes it could be a little dangerous or, you know, intimidating. Um, and it was, but it was mostly more difficult for me because my Chinese was much better than my Arabic. And so we were studying mm. Arabic while we were there. Yeah. And although mm. I did reach a point where I could travel by myself and do interviews by myself, I couldn't go to interview like the government official in Arabic. I didn't feel comfortable doing that mm. without a mm. translator. Whereas in Chinese, mm. I, I, I could do that. And so that was one difference. But in general, you know, the... <laughs> The Chinese are much better at monitoring journalists than the Egyptians are, you know, and so it was a lot easier to dodge the authorities in Egypt. I and mean, when I would go to that town in Upper Egypt in Sohag, you know, I would stay, there's only one hotel, I'd stay there and the police would often have a car parked out in front, the guys would be asleep, you know, and so I would just kind of, I would go out and just kind of really quietly start my car and get out and the guys wouldn't wake up. And then I'd start getting calls on my phone. And sometimes I would just turn off my phone, you know, cause I know that they're going to, once they realize that my car has gone, they're going to start calling, but they, they weren't very good at, uh, you know, the, the, the surveillance had a lot of holes. You know? So let me ask you about, um, how did you become interested in being a writer? Cause I read someplace that you, you didn't write anything in high school or college. So how, how did you get in? Well, I, I didn't do journalism. So I, you know, I wasn't in the, I wasn't on the school newspaper in, in yeah. high school or in college or anything like that. But I was, I became, I mean, I decided that I wanted to be a writer when I was in 10th grade um, at oh, Hickman really? High oh. School. Yeah. And that was oh. partly because of, or, you know, in large part because of my, my honors English teacher, Mary Racine. She was a, a great teacher there who, uh, you know, who, who really, uh, inspired a lot of kids. Um, and, uh, and she sort of encouraged me in that, that year when I was a 10th grader, she told me that, that I could, uh, you know, become a writer if I wanted to, and that this was something I should think about. The, uh, Hickman high school at that, at that moment had some really remarkable English instructors. So there was also Marianne Gates who taught me yeah. as a junior Kaki Westerfield, who taught me as a senior. So it was sort of known, you had these three remarkable English teachers when you went through that high school. Um, and I really benefited from that. And all of them encouraged me to write. Now, you know, I was somewhat of a mixed student. I mean, I was, you know, I, I think I was a little bored in school and I just, I don't know, I was sometimes difficult to deal with as a student. And all of those teachers were very patient with me. And they recognized that I had some some some, some ability, and they, they encouraged me. I think that was very important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I had some teachers in junior high who would also encourage me. Of course, you know, I did grow up in in a family that was very educated. My my father was a professor at yeah. the university. He, he's emeritus now, mm -hmm. and my mother taught history eventually at Columbia College. Um, ne neither of them was a writer per se in the in the way that I wanted to be a writer, but. You know, we we lived in a house with a lot of books. Uh, you know, literature and, and writing was important. Um, I think the, also one thing about Columbia is in that community, I was very aware of people who wrote, um, which I think is not very common if you're from a relatively small place yeah. in the middle mm -hmm. of America. You, but I mean, I could, I knew writers, right? I mean, like I delivered newspaper to Bill Payton, who was, you know, he taught at the University of Missouri. I think he was one of the editors of the Missouri Review. Um, mm -hmm. He had written books. He had books of short stories. I think he had a couple of novels. And he was just, he was one street over from me. You know, I think he was mm -hmm. on Tilly and I would deliver his newspaper. And mm -hmm. so I knew that this guy's a writer. You know, William Least Heat Moon, his, you know, yeah. Book, yeah. Blue Highways came out. I must have been a junior or high student or something like I was pretty young. Mm -hmm. But I remember vividly when that book came out because, of course, everybody in Columbia was talking about it. And, and, yeah. and, and, and William Lee Seatwoon's 
second wife lived across, had grown up across the street from me, you know? So these were like local connections. And when I was in Tripoli, sort of a, oh, yeah. uh, a gifted program in, in yeah. school, my teacher was Vesta Lezebnik. Um, and, and, and her husband was a professor at Stevens College. And he had helped Bill Trogdon edit that book, William Lee huh? I mean, he, he was, a, you know, a, he, a very important presence in, in William Lee Steedman's writing life. Um, and so, and, all, and also the, the Lezebnik's boys, they had three boys who all became writers. And so mm -hmm. I grew up with stories about these folks from the community. So he sort of gave me this idea that this is something you can do. It didn't seem like it was just a fantasy. I mean, there's people in my neighborhood who yeah, make yeah. a living writing. And um, one thing that I mentioned to you in an email that I noticed is your dedication and acknowledgement to Doug Hunt, someone that I know. Um, so how did you meet him? Yeah, I know Doug, you know, just lives a couple of streets over from my parents, right? So he's in the same neighborhood, the Stewart Road area. I first met Doug because I, when I was in college, I was interested in applying for a Rhodes Scholarship. And, and, and Doug was a Rhodes Scholar in the early 70s. And so I, uh, I spoke with him about it. That would have been 1991, I believe, when I was mm -hmm. applying. I was going into my last year at, at Princeton University. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so I knew him casually. And then I taught, I taught English 20 so after I came back from Oxford, I was in Columbia applying for the Peace Corps and I was doing a little bit of freelance writing. And I taught a couple sections of English 20 at the university and Doug was in charge of that program oh, at yeah. that time. Yeah. So, so he was the one who kind of showed me some of the syllabus and, and, and so on. And, and you know, he was the director of that. So we had some interaction then. I didn't know Doug very well though at that point. Um, but then when I came back from fooling and I wrote the first draft of Rivertown, I felt like I wanted somebody to see it but I, I wanted somebody who was a real writer. Um, I didn't, I wasn't so, I, to me, a China expert wasn't really the key thing. I felt like I wanted somebody, you know, who could look at this as a work of writing. Um, and to be honest, I thought a lot about uh, Jack Lezebnik and William Lee's Heat Moon because mm -hmm. from, from having Vesta having been my teacher, I was aware that William Lee's Heat Moon had this relationship with Jack Lezebnik, who, you know, that he gave mm -hmm. drafts of, of Blue Highways to to, mm. to Jack and 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 he had a huge impact on that book. Um, so I was thinking, you know, this might be something that's you know it, it would be great to have somebody. And there's I'm in this community with my parents live here, and there's all these writers and people at the university. There's you know mm. there's probably somebody, mm. and, and Doug was somebody that I had known, and I I knew also that you know he had a reputation for being an excellent editor, um, mm. and you know and, and a first rate writer. So I approached him. Um, and you know, he was the first one to read that book. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, which I had written without any contact with the publishing industry. I didn't have an agent. Was I mean, right? it was no, there was no way that I was going to go to an agent because, you know, this was in 1998 and nobody was that interested in China. And I was nobody. I mean, I hadn't written, I had published mm -hmm. a few essays and small things, but I hadn't published mm -hmm. anything significant. And so it wasn't like some New York publisher was going to be excited about a book about some town in China that nobody had ever heard of, right? I mean, this was not, and even when we sent that mm -hmm. book out with an agent and everything, many of the publishers rejected it and said, this is really nicely written, but nobody wants to read a book about China right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, but anyway, so I, I, I gave that draft to Doug um, and I, you know, I had no idea whether it was any good or not, to be honest. And really at that point, like having been in fooling in that isolation for two years and, you know, and that was a pretty poor part of China at that time. And then to come back out, live in my parents' home, I didn't have a job, you know, I didn't have a lot of money. I, you know, I picked, I had been infected with tuberculosis when I was in the Peace Corps. So I was, oh, going, down to, I was going down to the public health department in Columbia and picking up my, my TB meds every mm -hmm. month. And. I had some mm. other health problems. It was not an easy period. And I was writing this book very intensely without any idea whether it would ever be published. Um, and then I gave it to Doug. And I mean, it was, you know, meant a lot to me because he, he very quickly said, no, I, you know, I, I think this is really something. And, and you know, he, he gave me some pointers. I made some adjustments on early stuff. But a lot of what he gave me was confidence to go into the wider world with it. And so... Mm -hmm. After hearing from him and making some adjustments, I sent it to a number of agents in New York. Um, and not, I had no personal connection to them. I, you know, I just, just names on a list. Mm 
And two of them responded and were interested. And so I flew to New York and met with them. I, uh, I remember I bought a, I bought a suit in, what was that place called in downtown Columbia? Maybe it was Bart's. I, I, you know, I, had, I, had, I never owned a suit, so I went and bought a suit so I yeah. could go to New York go to New York and meet agents. But I, literally, I mean, if I should have known if you're a writer, you don't need a suit. <laughs> you know, that's the one that's <laughs> not necessary. You can just you can wear whatever you want. Just in case. Um, huh? But, uh, it, but anyway, that's how I got started. So I was, you know, huh? was, so Doug and I, that was, and that was an intense experience to sort of share something like that with him. And then when I went to China and started writing, we were corresponding a lot and I ended up to, so I would send him stories a lot of times and he would give me feedback on it. And he ended up also, helping me edit each of my books from there and from Egypt. So yeah. I've, I've really, yeah. you know, he's been incredibly generous over the years. Yes, he is. And, you know, of course we developed a close friendship as well um, during that time. And so it was yeah. really, you know, very meaningful thing for me, very important thing for me as a writer, you know, as, as a writer, you're very isolated, um, especially the kind of writing that I do. Um, and I had to learn to be fairly self-sufficient pretty early yeah. because I was not part of a news bureau. I did not have, proper editors in the state. I wasn't, you know, going to the New York Times and I could talk and meet with people face to face. I was really alone. Um, and as a young person, I think that that's really hard. And, you know, having the sort of this sort of stable writing relationship with Doug made a, made an enormous difference. Yeah. So let me ask you um, about your daughters. I know that they were they were probably born in 2010, maybe. Yeah, they were born in 2010 in, in Colorado. So they've lived in, oh, in Colorado, that's right. Colorado, Egypt, and now China. Um, where would they be from? <laughs> I mean, they're, you know, they consider themselves, you know, they're Coloradans, I think, in a, in oh, a way. That, um, huh? But it's a mixed identity. Yeah, I mean, we moved to Egypt when they were 17 months old. And so, yeah, no, huh. of course, they so their first home was Egypt and they loved Cairo. Um, and they had a really, right? huh. yeah, and it's a really good place for children. Egyptians are great with little kids, they really, they, I mean, huh. Egyptians are they're incredibly charismatic, outgoing, friendly, funny people. I mean, really, Egypt is a very hard place to live in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of problems there. And nobody would stay there if not for the Egyptian people because. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're sort of amazingly engaging. And that's what always made the place very human and very livable. Um, and the children really feel that when you have small children like, like we mm -hmm. did. You know, the Egyptians are just great with them and, and kids connect with them. Mm -hmm. And so they had a great experience. And I think Egypt is so vivid, right? I mean, the light, um, you know, you take the kids to the pyramids. We made all these trips down to the archaeological. Oh, and just uh, imagine uh, what that's like for a four-year-old or a five-year-old. It's an incredible experience. So they really loved it. And they consider themselves Egyptians in many ways. You know, when they, you know, when we went, when we moved to Colorado and they were, they just turned six and we brought them into the school. I remember going to one of the parents' activities after we had just got it started there and some talking to some guy, kind of a rural Colorado guy who were living in a small town. And he's like, I said, we just moved from Egypt. And he's like, oh my, he's like, my kid said that his class had two girls from Egypt. <laughs> two Egyptian huh? girls. He said, two Egyptian huh? oh, girls. Two Egyptian girls. And yeah. he's like, I just, I just thought he was lying. You know, and it was huh? like, huh? but it, but they, they would sometimes tell me, yeah, we're from Egypt. You know, they, they really believed it. Um, huh? But, you know, we were, in, one reason why we set up a home in Colorado was so that they would have, I want, we want them to understand that they are American and we want them to be connected to a huh? community huh? in the United States. And, and they, they do have that. Like they, there is a strong identity that they have as being Coloradans. Um, but of course, they're adding other things to that identity. Um, mm -hmm. And these two years so where in do China. They, where do they go to school now? What kind of school? Uh, they go to a public school. So they, you know. A Chinese public that, school? Huh. Yeah, that was one of our big projects here. It was one of the reasons mm -hmm. that, and one of the reasons I wanted to teach again was because we knew that if I was a professor here, it's much easier to get children into the public school. Generally speaking, foreigners don't attend public schools. They go to international schools. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we weren't interested in that because, I, the internet, first of all, the international schools are expensive. Um, they're private. And they just, you know, they, they draw. Nowadays, there are not even that many foreigners there. It's mostly very elite Chinese with foreign passports. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, I would be paying 
I don't know, thirty thirty thousand dollar tuition a year for my mm -hmm. daughters to be teaching English <laughs> to other kids, basically. Yeah. And so yeah. I didn't see the point of that. I figured, uh, you know, let's put our kids in the Chinese school and they'll learn about they'll learn the Chinese language and they'll learn about China. Mm -hmm. But it took a lot of work, you know. So you have to, in order to get permission to do that, we had to have a lot of face to face meetings with people, and you know, there was no official channel really to do this. It was just, you know meeting folks and finding a school that was interested and open. Um, and so we were able to do that. And so they go to a public school here. Of course, they didn't speak any Chinese when we showed up. We, we never spoke Chinese to them. So um, that, so they would have been nine years old when you moved there? Yeah, yeah. About, so they yeah. were... So it's yeah, like so third, third grade? Fourth well, grade? So it's, it's, their schooling was a little weird because they had finished... So in... Uh, they started early because in, in, in Egypt, they did go to private schools because you couldn't send kids to an Egyptian school. So they, they were in the British system. And so they started early there. So actually, they finished fourth grade in the United States before we moved to, to Egypt. They would have been going in. I mean, before we moved to China, they would have been going into the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. But we decided because of the language to move them back to the third grade. So they're doing third grade and fourth grade twice. You know, sometimes I tell them, you know, how many kids do you know who have done, who have repeated both the third and the fourth grade? And, and do you think that those children are very intelligent? But um, it's in Chinese, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. But, you know, I always yeah. tease them about yeah. this. That they're the, sure. only kids who, the only kids who have done, who have repeated the third and fourth grade. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, so we, we put them into the third grade. Um, and also because yeah. Chinese math is very intense. Um, but they, and they had no Chinese it's language. Very, and very intense. <laughs> Math is really difficult, and so we knew that we knew that third grade math in China is going to be like fifth grade math in America. Um, but you know, it was a tough adjustment for the first semester. It took a lot of support uh, from me and especially from Leslie. Um, but after the by the end of the first semester, their Chinese was quite good, and by the end of the first year, they were totally fluent and had no problems doing anything. That is that, the other kids is that right? Do. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's uh, been a great experience. The school has been very open and welcoming to them, and yeah. But you don't have any plans to come back to the U.S. until the pandemic is over, right? Uh, no, we're going to be back in the U.S. this summer. Um, in the summer you were coming. We're coming back because it's been two years. We need yeah. to, to to see family and friends, and yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as after that. It's unclear. There's a lot of mm. uncertainties right now, and the U.S.-China mm. relations are so complicated that it's unclear what our path is forward. Yeah, yeah. it's hard to get visas, so, basically. Yeah. So let me ask you: um, Have you ever thought of writing a, a sixth book on America? I mean, to take your uh, methodology or your habits and look at. The yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have any plans for it now. Um, I've always wanted, there's probably a memoir that I'll write at some point, uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. maybe after we leave China, mm -hmm. after I'm done with, with writing about China during, on, on, this, on this period. Um, but I don't have any, any other plans. I mean, maybe that will develop at some point. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what the, what the future will yeah. hold in that sense. Uh -huh. Yeah. Are you working on another book project now? Or just articles for the New Yorker. Well, I'm, you know, I'm but those are quite long. Right? Yeah, I'm gathering material that will eventually be a book about China during this period. Um, and so I haven't started writing that book yet because I'm teaching full time and writing full, writing sure. for the New Yorker full yeah. time. And so, yeah. whenever yeah. this phase is finished, I'll start working on that book. Yeah. Well, you must take quite uh, detailed notes. Every day. Oh, yeah. Every day. You might, yeah. Yeah. No, you have to, you know, I, I learned that early as a writer. I mean, that was why I was able to write Rivertown because I didn't have the plan to write that book when I showed up in the Peace Corps. Um, but I did take incredibly detailed notes and diary entries. If something interesting happened, yeah. and I would write it down. Um, and this was really partly a way to process things. It was also because, you know, at that time we didn't have any internet connection. And so, you know, I didn't, I wasn't online. I wasn't even communicating with family and friends on email. I had a lot of time. So I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time studying Chinese, um, but I also spent a lot of time writing down what I was observing. 
And that meant that when I got the idea to write Rivertown, which was about six months left in my time in fooling, um, I could go back through those notes and I had I had recorded a huge amount of things. And so it was yeah. very easy for me to write. It was relatively easy for me to write that book. And so I learned you, you can't rely on your memory. You know, you, you have to put this stuff down immediately and, and you need to, you know, it, it, it can't be in a notebook. So, so everywhere I go, you know, I always have in my pocket right now, I can pull it, you know, I've always have one of these. I've got a you know, notebook and you have, you know, there'll be all kinds of like scrawled, right? And there'll be some Chinese in there and some English. And, and you know, so that's very, I'm, that's very old fashioned. You don't do it on a smartphone? No, 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 no. I got to have a notebook. So I just, you know, there's always so, uh, certain, certain, so I have a notebook. But after I take notes in the notebook, I type them into my computer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, you know, you're not going to be able to understand your writing after 20 days or something. You know, there's always, you know, so so I everything goes into my computer. I have a very detailed fire file system. I, you know, I teach writing here and I show my students here my system for filing in the computer, in which they always find pretty fascinating. But it's very mm -hmm. important. You know, you, you have to be, you have to know where you keep things and you have to be able to search them. But so I can go you right now and in three minutes, I can pull up all the papers that my students wrote in fooling in 19, in the fall of 1996, mm. or I can mm. look for the ones in the spring of 1997. You know, I've got all of that stuff organized in ways that I can search it and find it and uh, go through it. And I still use that material a lot, you know, and so that's really important as a, you know, yeah. as a nonfiction writer. Well, you can really see it in your work. I mean, what um, appeals to me is the, you know, your, so sociological observations with the depth of these conversations with all the people that you met. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I was influenced in terms of sociology. It was definitely influenced by my father, is you know, sociologist. So, I, you know, I learned a lot from him, even though I didn't study sociology formally. But you know, he would talk a lot about methodology and talk about mm -hmm. his projects and strategies for interviewing. Um, I was also very fortunate that at university I had great writing teachers at, at Princeton, the most important one being John McPhee. Yeah. Um, and so John's the kind of person who takes incredibly detailed notes and has very, he has very rigid systems for his writing process. Now I've never adopted mm. his systems, but I realize that you do need a system. You need to find the mm. one that works for you. Um, and I learned that when I was in his course, you know, in 1991. And so by the time I was in places like fooling, I was already thinking systematically, how do you keep your notes? And then how do you structure your book? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Well, um, I've used too much time, I see. We're supposed to limit to 45 minutes. Is I'm going to add Peter Hesler's um, website. And you should especially look across the top menu where each of his five books are listed, his Rivertown. And you can see that there's a description or more information on each of the five books in a very convenient way. So take a look at that. And there's also notes about the reception in China.